Hello and welcome to a new video with the electric trucker. This week I will do my first heavy duty transport and get my hazardous goods certification. It's Monday 4 in the morning and I'm on my way to pick up a new low bed trailer for a heavy haul tomorrow. I'll head south towards Ulm where I'll pick up a container for a new Mylands truck charging park in the Netherlands. I picked up the trailer and connected everything. What makes the trailer special is that it sits very low to the ground, making it perfect for transporting bulky items and it can be extended for longer loads. It has two rear axles that can be steered and that's why it needs a power connection. Someone is going to tell me all the details now because it has a bunch of levers and is pretty complex. I can't tell you how relieved I'll be once I'm on the highway. This trailer handles so weird because the rear axles steer so much. You almost have to drive like you don't have a trailer at all. You can make tight turns with it, but after months of driving a regular trailer, this is a whole different ball game. Driving around in an urban environment is really tricky because every steering input gets punished right away. There's a notch at the fifth wheel that measures how much the truck is turning, and based on that, the trailer detects the angle and hydraulically steers the rear axle. At first, the Evoco didn't like it either. The trailer started drawing power from the 24 volt battery, and that triggered some error messages. It even shut down the trailer once. The software probably isn't prepared for it and stops it as a safety measure. But as long as you don't let the trailer's hydraulic pump run continuously, but give it short breaks in between, it works. And now I'm here at the dyno with my Evoco, and we're about to find out how much power it really has. Since there are massive forces involved, the vehicle needs to be properly secured to give it more traction. Otherwise, the wheels would just spin on the rollers. So, it's strapped down at the front, at the front axle, around the rear axle, and from the back with straps tightened around the frame. The problem is that the truck is just insanely powerful. You can think of the rear rollers like a bicycle dynamo. It gets harder to pedal when the dynamo is pressed against the tire. That's essentially how the brake on the test bench works. We simulate more resistance by adding dynamos, so to speak, making it harder for the vehicle to accelerate, and then we remove some again. Based on how fast the truck can accelerate, we get a performance measurement. With a Scania 770, you might get around 2,000 Newton meters of torque at around 800 RPM. That's already really impressive. But earlier we measured 3,500 Newton meters with this truck and I only had the throttle halfway down, which means traction becomes a real issue. The tire starts to slip on the rollers. There's clearly way more torque in the system, but if I strap the truck down even harder, I risk damaging it. We'll try another measurement based on speed instead, but that amount of force coming in all at once is just crazy. I don't want to break the test bench, so we're going to let everything cool down first, then we'll give it another go. 3,500 Newton meters at 900 RPM is just insane. Absolutely insane. Now we're doing a speed test. We're starting the measurement at around 40 kilometers per hour or 25 miles per hour. The test bench applies braking force on both sides so that we can only drive at 40 kilometers per hour. That means I can go full throttle, but it brakes hard enough to keep us rolling at just that speed. And this is going to be insane because we have so much power here, so much torque at the wheels already, that it's almost impossible to measure the truck properly. If it doesn't work, we'll just stop the test because I don't want to brake anything. You could tell it just spun out and instantly lost traction. It's insane. No way we can measure it like this. You sometimes see that kind of thing in the US with high performance tuning cars. When they turn a Lamborghini into a 2000 horsepower monster, they take the tires off and measure directly at the wheel hub. That's basically what we'd have to do here too. As soon as I go full throttle, it just slips. What I can say is that the torque delivery is just incredibly linear. And if we could properly measure it, I'm confident that it would have more than 1300 horsepower. I got my performance report from the test, and the last measurement showed a peak of 752 horsepower, but then the tires lost traction. That's why they wrote on the report, not measurable. Good morning. A new day begins, but the charging station isn't giving full power. Yesterday it was at 300 kilowatts, and now despite there being no one else here, I'm only getting 220 kilowatts. This load management from Aral is really unpredictable and a real issue because logistic companies need predictability. 
and I can't quickly uncouple the trailer because I need to use the hydraulic pump to prevent the trailer from tipping forward. It's all much more complicated and takes way more time. And the consumption of this trailer is also extremely high at 1.4 kilowatt hours per kilometer. The trailer weighs 13 tons when empty and it's cold at minus 2 degrees. And the sanitary container for the Mylands charging park will add another 10 tons. But due to the over width and dimensions, it's also aerodynamically inefficient. There's also a large gap between the truck and the container which catches the wind and further increases the consumption. I think I might have overdone it with using the electric truck for this because it's really next level and I'll need to use an ultra-conservative strategy to get through this. The cargo is secured and the warning signs are out because the truck is now over width. This is the toilet for the Mylens charging park and the other module my colleague is transporting is the lounge. My colleague couldn't extend the old low bed trailer because it was frozen tight. We tried to force it, but it wouldn't budge. In the end, we managed to get it free with a Bunsen burner. You can clearly see that there's liquid where it shouldn't be, and that's what caused it to be completely stuck. Since I left early this morning, I don't have enough driving hours to reach the destination, so I'll head out at 9 in the evening when there's less traffic. I'll also only choose charging stations where I don't need to uncouple. In construction sites where the left lane is also narrowed, you really have to be careful. Especially in curves, you have to block both lanes so no one gets the idea to overtake in the curve. It's definitely more comfortable at night because there's less traffic, but you can no longer see the back of the trailer, which is a completely different driving experience. The energy consumption isn't as bad as I thought. I'm currently at 1.1 kilowatt hours per kilometer, and I expected 1.5. I can't quite explain why it's so efficient right now, but maybe it's because I'm going downhill at the moment. The charging stop is going well, I was worried that the trucks would be parked all over the place and make it difficult to get to the charging station, but I got lucky. When driving out, I just have to be careful not to hit the bollard because the trailer swings out so far at the back. The consumption has gone up. It's been very hilly and it's currently minus 2 degrees. These are the toughest conditions and I'm at 1.7 kilowatt hours per kilometer now and for the entire trip it's at 1.5. I absolutely need to arrive safely so I'll make an extra charging stop. Usually you can't charge here because it's full of cars but it's 4 in the morning. I'll have to make one more stop in Venlo and then I'll be done. And earlier I questioned myself if heavy transport with an electric truck makes sense but now we know it does because it works and in the summer it will be even easier. I'm now at the truck stop in Venlo. I have enough energy and driving hours to reach the destination but the crane for unloading won't arrive for another few hours and the charging stations they're setting up aren't operational yet. And these chargers are not throttled like the ones at Errol Pulse. They really provide the full power the truck can handle, 350 kilowatts. We arrived at the Mylands Charging Park. It's located in an industrial area by the highway and there's already a lot of digging and construction happening. Krümelix and I are doing a construction site inspection. It's a huge site and we're now waiting for the crane. But this is probably a good location for the charging park because it's fairly close to the highway and right next to the substation. That means there's plenty of power available and the grid expansion isn't as expensive, which has a big impact on the costs for a truck charging park. The startup Ecovia is responsible for the quality of stay at the Mylands charging parks. And we transported their lounge and toilet today. At this location, there's more space, so a lounge is being built with a coffee machine and snack machine. All CPOs try to build their locations near gas stations or grocery stores, but that's not always possible. We are enjoying our Sunday rest because the past few days I had my ADR hazardous materials training, which lasted two and a half days, and there's an exam at the end. 
There are a couple of important things I wanted to quickly share with you. One of the most important is the thousand point rule. Every hazardous material has a certain classification based on how dangerous it is. By multiplying that with a specific factor, you can determine how dangerous the entire transport is. If the total is below a thousand points, it's not subject to labeling, and you can transport hazardous materials without an ADR certificate. That was the case with the life rafts I transported to the UK, but I had to unfold the labels because maritime law differs from road law. And I can now explain to you what the different hazard labels mean. There are nine classes, explosives, flammable gases, flammable liquids, flammable solids, oxidizing substances, toxic substances, radioactive substances, corrosive substances, and class nine, which covers everything that doesn't fit into the first categories. And there are three additional certifications for more specialized hazardous materials transport. These are for explosive substances, radioactive materials, and for tank vehicles carrying more than 3000 liters of hazardous liquids. But I didn't hear anything about electric trucks. I actually had to ask, and the only restriction is that certain explosive materials cannot be transported with an electric truck. There's a misconception that you can't transport hazardous goods with an electric vehicle, but that's not true. But what bothered me a bit was that the instructor was unmotivated and only focused on getting us through the exam somehow. I feel like many truck drivers leave without being much smarter than before, which is a shame because there's a lot of responsibility involved. But that's generally a problem in education. When the instructor or presenter isn't motivated, it becomes a dire experience. But this ADR certificate wasn't that hard. It's single choice, meaning you have four answer options and have to choose one. So you already have a 25% chance of being right. Out of 30 questions, you need to get 25 correct. And from the way the questions were phrased, I'd say I could have passed even without taking any course beforehand because they're just so weird and awkwardly worded that you can get through by sheer luck. Still, a few people managed to fail. But you can't make the exam too difficult. There are already too few truck drivers, and if it were any harder, no one would transport dangerous goods anymore. Anyway, thanks for joining me this week, and I'll see you next time. Bye.